Good evening. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is James Brown. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science here at TUJ. Those of you who are regulars to ICAS events uh, will be used to seeing Robert Dujaric, um, kind of doing his, his moderator bit. Uh, unfortunately, he's away at the moment, which is why I'm doubling as both moderator and one of the speakers as well. I've got a few initial announcements, though, uh, first of all, to do with video recording. As perhaps you can see, we're video recording the event this evening, and that will include the, the Q&A session which comes afterwards. Those of you who have been to ICAS events before will know that one of the sort of main features is that we try and give as much time as possible to Q&A. So um, I just need to let you know that if you are going to uh, ask a question, then you should use the, the microphone which is in the, the center there. Uh, and that's if you're willing to be on camera. If you don't want to be on camera, in that case, um, we'd ask you to take, uh, to ask your questions from, uh, from your seats. Okay, so that's one of the initial things. Uh, also, I'm told that I should pass on to make sure that your phones are on silent mode. And also a note about the capacity of the, the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi capacity on campus is limited. We would appreciate if you would avoid unnecessary Wi-Fi usage during the event. Of course, you shouldn't be using your phones during <laughs> the presentations anyway. But, uh, so that's all of the initial things that I needed to mention. So uh, I am now going to introduce uh, our first speaker. And we're delighted to have Anna Kirieva uh, with us here. She is Associate Professor at Moscow State University of International Affairs, that's Mugimo, the university associated with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she's going to be speaking on Russia's approach to security on the Korean Peninsula. So there'll be three presentations in total, each about 20 minutes, and then over to Q&A. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you, James, for having me here, for inviting me. Um, maybe the, uh, I will start a little bit from a uh, couple of words on overall Russia's sea station policy. Um, and um, so the role of the Korean Peninsula in Russia's East Asian policy, why does it really matter? Uh, Russia's position on North Korean nuclear missile program and uh, on security issues on the Korean Peninsula in general. I will also try to cover a little bit about Russia South Korea uh, concerning this topic, but uh, I think we won't have too much time on that, but we'll be happy to answer your questions if you're interested in Russia South Korea as well. And uh, finally, what, uh, how Russia's view how all these issues on the, on the Korean Peninsula should be settled. So to begin with, um, uh, if we look at Russia's station policy, we should say that it didn't start, wasn't launched uh, like three or four years ago. Uh, it's a, a more, um, uh, it's a uh, more long-term strategic dimension of Russia's foreign policy. One of the major, actually, strategic dimensions of Russia's foreign policy, uh, and uh, it is kind of strategic course to diversify relations uh, with um, different states and uh, with the states of East Asia, which has emerged as the most dynamic region in the world. So it's quite natural that Russia, which uh, perceives itself to be a great power, should have. Uh, strong positions in the region where it ge geographically belongs to. Um, so a kind of Eurasian or, or, or Euro-Pacific power uh, and should of course achieve a more balanced foreign policy and more balanced economic policy. Uh, and uh, Russia desires to to be an uh, independent player and to enhance its positions uh, as one of the centers of power in what it thinks should be a polycentric regional order in East Asia, meaning that there should be different centers of power uh, in the region. And of course, we have our own internal agenda, which means developing of the Russian Far East uh, and uh, relations with East Asia should be the stimulus for Russia's, for developing Russia's um, relations with the Far East. Um, and of course, we can say that the crisis with in relations with the US and Europe uh, made Russia facilitate its Asian, what, what we call Asian's, uh, Asian pivot, uh, uh, just uh, bringing uh, uh, the example of uh, the US policy or turn to the East, in other words. Um, and um, if we look how Russia approaches basically the security on the uh, in East Asia, we should say that Russia rejects so-called block security. It does not appreciate that. Um, and uh, the idea is that Russia should uh, that uh, Russia promotes an inclusive. Um, 
open, transparent and equitable comprehensive security architecture in East Asia uh, that should provide security for everyone, not just to one state at the expense of other states. Um, and uh, the second probably major point is that Russia views that the order in East Asia should be polycentric. Uh, although, of course, I should say to be realistic that Russia is the weakest of major players in East Asia. Uh, and of course, um, East Asia, uh, in East Asia overall, the major security concern for Russia is, its, um, is of course, the Korean Peninsula. It is one of so-called uh, high-impact, low-probability threats for Russia in Russia's foreign policy. Uh, and uh, this, we, we can argue that this is the major potential threat for Russia in East Asia at all, overall. And simultaneously, I would argue, it has several dimensions for Russia. One is global, uh, meaning uh, support for non-proliferation and relations with other great powers, first and foremost, the US and China. Also regional, uh, economic and security issues, and bilateral, meaning relations with both Koreas. Um, and um, if we look a little bit on history, we can see that uh, there uh, used to be some imbalance straight after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and relations shifted at first uh, in favor of South Korea. But then Russia took a more balanced approach and managed to, well, at least somehow to mend deteriorated relations with North Korea uh, and uh, conclude uh, Russia-North Korea Friendship Treaty. And Russia was a very active participant of six-party talks from 2003 to 2008, and even um, and gave a lot of proposals. Many of these proposals actually were the foundations of the declarations that were adopted by six-party talks over the North Korean nuclear issue. And Russia also had a, a group on Northeast Asia security architecture. And uh, in Russia's foreign policy and in its policy in East Asia, that mattered a lot, as Russia. Um, so it, uh, that it could exercise the so-called honest intermediary role, meaning that it could become an intermediary in major conflicts in Asia and play a constructive role here. Uh, and Russia also advocated trilateral economic projects as one of the means to reduce tensions and de-escalate situation on the Korean Peninsula. Trilateral, including Russia, South Korea and North Korea. And there are three major projects. One of them has been realized partly, though uh, this is railroad, connecting Trans-Siberian Railroad and uh, the Korean Railroad. Uh, I will show it later. And the other two only projects not realized at all, got gas pipeline and electric power lines from Russia to South Korea uh, through North Korean territory. Um, so of these projects, uh, only this Hassan Rajin became a reality, connecting Trans-Siberian um, uh, station uh, uh, regime, uh, or so, I'm sorry, Siberian Station Hassan with, South, with North Korean port regime, which does not freeze in winter. And we saw uh, some cooperation uh, with China uh, when Russia exported its coal via Hassan regime to China and even to South Korea in, in 2015 and 2016. And uh, actually, Russia uh, and North Korea uh, had a rather good period in their economic cooperation uh, in these two years from 2013 till 2015 all of this stopped uh, when North Korea began uh, actively um, it's, it's, it's active missiles and nuclear program um, and South Korea eventually pulled out of this project Hassan Rajin in 2016 as well. And it now is still in place. Actually, it's not affected by sanctions. It has been always out of sanction regime, but it's now continuous bilateral project and it's trilateral with China. So um, for us, a military conflict on the Korean Peninsula is the most critical threat, as I already said, in East Asia. And possible results for Russia could be the outflow of North Korean refugees, both by land and by sea and contamination of uh, Russian territory, possible damage of Russian territory in case the weapons of mass destruction are employed. Uh, that's why in Russia's perspective, Russia really does need peace and stability in the region to develop its Far East region and in order to, to have stable environment. So uh, from Russia's perspective, that's why this issue should be discussed by political and diplomatic means uh, without force or without use of uh, resort to force or threat 
threats and without pressure besides the UN Security Council. In Russia's eyes, the only legitimate instrument here uh, not undermining global governance should be UN Security Council resolutions, but not unilateral sanctions. Uh, so Russia uh, is a strong proponent of non-proliferation regime, actually, in one of the countries which cite NPT. That's why it would never officially um, recognize North Korea as a nuclear state and is never going to do so. Uh, and as I said, it is uh, interested in peaceful resolution of the uh, nuclear issue and revival of the six-party talks because Russia be does believe that it is the best option for Russia's foreign policy and for de-escalating and negotiating this uh, issue. And also Russia does understand that uh, c complete verif verifiable uh, d destruction of nuclear weapons uh, of North Korea is a very important goal, but it, it does not perceive it as a short-term goal and perceives that denuclearization of the whole Korean Peninsula should be a, a long-term goal and cannot be achieved like in, in, in short term. Um, and of course, um, I think what differs Russia's position from that of um, uh, many other states uh, and in what is similar somehow to China, that Russia um, takes into account and understands, I should say, the reasons why North Korea decided to develop its nuclear program. When I say understands, I mean not supports, but simply understands what concerns made uh, North Korea do that. Um, and uh, this is the policy, the US policy of regime change, uh, which Russia is very well familiar with. And uh, of course, uh, North Korea having lost its security, uh, been a, uh, well, security guarantees from the Soviet Union, uh, decided that uh, it needed to survive, and survival is of often um, um, referred to as the ultimate goal of the North Korean regime. Uh, and Russian experts mostly stress that North Korea behaves rationally rather than irrationally, meaning that survival of the regime is the ultimate goal. And that's why uh, North Korea wants to, to uh, develop a kind of strategic parity with the US. And it believes that acquired deterrence capability should uh, made it possible, should enable it to uh, develop this strategic parity. And this should be done by um, developing ICBM with nuclear warhead that could reach US mainland. Uh, so speaking about North Korea, it probably hopes that uh, this would help North Korea negotiate a peace treaty with the US and gain security guarantees from the US. Uh, this is what North Korea really believes it needs. Um, and. Uh, that it uh, that U.S. could thus accept its sovereignty and independence. Um, however, of course, Russia notes that North Korea does not actually uh, take any action to alleviate concerns of South Korea and Japan, that nuclear weapons could be used as a threat, as a, a weapon to blackmail them into something. So, and um, North Korea says that only if U.S. aggressive behavior stops, it could think of uh, the nuclear free zone on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and uh, of course, I should say that Russia understands very well that North Korean regime is not fully reliable. Uh, we have no illusions about that. Uh, so we, 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 uh, we do not like dictatorships. But uh, suggesting um, uh, Russia is suggesting that new North Korean concerns should also be taken into consideration if we are to reach any. Uh, well, decision, any uh, resolution finally. Uh, because if we do not take any concerns of North Korea, we would never settle this issue. Uh, so, and the, the only way is, as I already said, is to create a kind of a collective architecture that would cater something about North Korea as well. Uh, just n not only those who suffer because of North Korea. Um, having said that, uh, I should really stress that Russia does condemn every North Korean nuclear and missile test. Russia understands these concerns, why North Korea deci uh, decided to do that, but doesn't share uh, North Korean actions. And uh, it opposes that North Korea violates all uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions uh, and supports further sanctions. But to some extent, I should say, uh, Russia does not support economic blockade, full economic blockade, or total oil embargo uh, to of, of import to North Korea. And Russia believes that sanctions 
uh, are useful because this is the pressure and uh, North Korea, which violates uh, UN sanctions, should be punished. This is true. But at, le uh, at the same time, it should uh, make North Korea think about engagement and make, uh, think no uh, make North Korea think about abandoning its provocative behavior. And uh, Moscow also seems very skeptical that only sanctions and only pressure would work. Uh, in, in the eyes of uh, the government, um, uh, sanctions, uh, well, um, they, uh, if they are uh, further taken so that it would be a de facto blockade, it would not happen, um, uh, it, it, it would not help uh, settle the issue. Um, and uh, Russia is also aware about possible humanitarian concerns that uh, the population, North Korean population, will suffer because of these sanctions. Um, and that, well, and generally, of course, as you may know, Russia is not happy about sanctions in general as a, a foreign policy tool. It has its reasons. Um, and, uh, well, of course, uh, in, in this regard, Russia is critical of unilateral sanctions. For example, especially U.S. sanctions uh, besides the U.N. security. Council resolutions. Um, however, Russia supported all the sanctions in these two years, 2016 and 17, despite the fact that Russia's own economic interests actually suffered because of the sanctions and suffered a lot. For example, Russia will have to deport North Korean labor from the Far East, and there is about 32,000 North Koreans working in the Far East. And this is of uh, very much importance because the Far East is heavily underpopulated. Only 6 million people live there. We're trying to develop these territories, but we don't have labor force. But we have to deport North Koreans. Uh, if you look at South Korea and the reason why Russia thinks South Korea is an important partner, uh, there are two main factors, I should say. Uh, first, uh, of course, uh, cooperation with South Korea, unlike the North, well, uh, can promote modernization of Russia and development, high-tech development, uh, and especially of the Far East. And the second, Russia does believe that uh, North Cor uh, South Korea can contribute also to the peaceful resolution of the Korean Peninsula issue. Um, I probably will have to touch only just a, a brief things about South Korea. As I said, uh, in general, R Russia believes that South-North dialogue is very important to settling the issue on the Korean Peninsula, and that without South-North dialogue, we would never be able to do that. Uh, so it should be part of the issue, and Russia will welcomed the so-called liberal decade of South Korea's foreign policy and did not share the same views with conservatives. Um, and South Korea is Russia's third Asian trading partner. Uh, 2016 trade turnover was, oh, a mistake, I'm sorry, uh, $15 billion. Uh, but uh, th this was a drop from 2014 when it was 28. And now it is restoring. Uh, we still don't have statistics of last year, but probably it will be about uh, more to more than 25 billion dollars and uh, we um, South Korea is number 10 Russian trading partner uh, Russia is number 13 South Korea's trading partner and, th and there is a lot of investment however we do have problems like unbalanced trade structure with South Korea we mostly sell energy and processed goods in exchange for manufactured goods and goods with higher added value um, a couple of points about THAAD, I should say. Uh, Russia um, expressed its concern about THAAD deployment. Um, and um, just not because THAAD is threatening Russia directly. Um, uh, this is a difference uh, with China in this regard. Uh, the X radar, which THAAD employs, does not cover Russian uh, nuclear uh, potential or Russian missile launchers. Uh, but Russia believes that this is a kind of a disproportionate measure and it further uh, it undermines strategic balance uh, in the region uh, and uh, that Russia, well, and China probably should take other steps to in order to restore it. And uh, only further aggravate security provoking North Korea. Uh, so it's again not a direct threat. Um, and uh, I think it's very important that Russia and China increase their cooperation. For the first time in 2016, Russia and China had uh, uh, joint exercises on ballistic missile defense, computer simulation, which we never did before. And uh, Russia and China also had them uh, last year. And uh, 
I should say that Russia is very positive about Moon Jae-in coming to power uh, and uh, hoping that uh, that South-North dialogue could be resumed, which we have already seen, uh, at least partly, in the beginning of January. Uh, and um, there was a huge meeting between Putin and Moon Jae-in when Moon Jae-in visited uh, the East uh, uh, Economic Forum. And of course we could see that there is a convergence of Russia's East Asian policy and uh, South Korea's new northern policy and nine bridges of cooperation with which Moon Jae-in proposed in order to enhance relations with Russia. Uh, and as I said, Russia welcomes South-North dialogue. However, we have got this factor. Uh, the yes factor, uh, of course, it's very important for Russia. And uh, Russia regards the US, uh, that US actions are also provoking instability instead of stabilizing the situation, especially under President Trump. Um, and no, well, his rhetoric, I think, is, is undoubtedly provoking the situation, escalating the situation. And uh, also the difference is that Russian experts mostly believe that no, um, like that there is no easy military solution, that U.S. won't, uh, won't be able to destroy nuclear weapons by, like, um, by uh, airstrikes only and that a full-scale military operation uh, would be needed in order to, uh, to, to destroy all uh, North Korean nuclear potential. And this, again, could uh, uh, turn into a full-scale war with uh, just uh, a, human a human catastrophe for South Korea and probably Japan. So Russia would never support military actions on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and as I said, Russia also opposes UN, oh, I'm sorry, US, uh, sanctioning Russian companies. Uh, and you know, the Congress statements that Congress and the US should even uh, inspect uh, Russian uh, ports in uh, the Far East if we, they comply with the sanctions. And several days ago, on January 18, Rex Tillerson said that, uh, accused Russia that it's not fully complying to the sanctions. And we had our own response from uh, Deputy Foreign Minister who said that the United Nations Commission on Sanctions never had any uh, objections that Russia is not complying fully. And again, there has been no proof of that. Um, and uh, I'm finishing. Um, so, uh, what Russia thinks should be done in the in the end? Uh, it may seem a little bit unrealistic to you. I don't know, but um, most Russian experts and our government believes that this is the only way forward. Um, we have the roadmap, uh, which was uh, proposed by Russia and supported by China, uh, and uh, is now um, referred to officially as Russia Chinese roadmap. Uh, on the resolution of the Korean issue. Um, so we should start from Dahl Freeze proposal, meaning uh, North Korea freezes its nuclear and missile program, and in return for that, because North Korea needs something in return, uh, South Korea and US should halt or at least downgrade uh, their military exercises, which emulate uh, invading the Korean Peninsula and eliminating North Korean regime. Uh, so this is a freeze for a freeze, meaning dual freeze. Uh, the second uh, phase should be uh, uh, harder to achieve, of course. Uh, it is uh, laying the foundations for negotiations. At first, on how to interact, on basic principles of interaction, meaning how could we move forward from this situation and somehow hold negotiations. Um, it should be bilateral, both, and multilateral. And bilateral should include U.S. North Korea, because as I said previously, North Korea ultimately needs U.S. guarantees of non-interference. It doesn't want guarantees from any other country, only from U.S. and South-North dialogue, of course. And the third stage should be formally moving to six-party talks uh, and uh, then settling this issue uh, through a long-term, probably, negotiation process, which would include denuclearization, some security guarantees for North Korea, and an ultimate goal of establishing a collective security system. Um, I will not touch on Russia and China, but uh, this is the very last. Um, sorry. Um, so Russia proposes that it should act as a mediator or an honest intermediary on the Korean issue because uh, Russia now holds a unique role in this case. Um, 
North Korea takes rather negative stance towards China since 2013, and uh, well, because it sees China meddling into its uh, affairs, and and that's why uh, North Korea has been showing well a little bit more positive stance towards Russia nowadays than towards um, China, um, and um, Russia has got uh, working level relations with North Korea, um, meaning that it's working level, it's not high level actually. Um, but uh, as I said, Russia understands and has no illusions that the regime, North Korean regime, can be fully trusted. And that's why there are certain limits in Russia's engaging North Korea. And the, f the major thing is that our trade is very, very small. Uh, Opposing to China, Russia does not have real leverage how to deal with North Korea because our trade turnover, if you can see on the slide, is less than $100 billion. It's not big and China accounts for about 90% of external trade. Um, and uh, Russia also does not have uh, high level summits with North Koreans, we don't. Uh, that's why of course our instruments are limited here. And we don't have economic, uh, we cannot build economic pressure like China can, for example. And Russia, of course, would prefer status quo with positive dynamics, all in all. And of course, I should say that it insist, uh, Russia insists on six-party talks, so that Russia itself could also be somehow present, so that this matter is not negotiated, for example, only by US and China, bilaterally. Uh, this is also important for Russia. And um, I should say that Russia is very unlikely to be uh, um, directly involved in, into the hostilities, into any contingency if it takes place. So, um, and of course, uh, what is uh, of utmost concern to Russia uh, is possible negative consequences for non-proliferation, a global dimension, and a potential domino effect if South Korea and Japan could develop nuclear weapons or could later acquire uh, ballistic missile defense, which is already happening. Uh, so uh, this is a huge concern to Russia. And mm, Russian experts also say that uh, we should uh, uh, we, we should have different solutions, at least for now, for missile and nuclear programs. Uh, in short term, it is very important to arrest specifically missile program. Uh, because, as I said, denuclearization could only be viable as a long-term goal. And uh, we should propose different scenarios. Uh, and a missile program is very important now, un uh, until North Korea has reached its full potential uh, of its ICBMs. Uh, so that um, nothing happens uh, with uh, this. And it's important to de-escalate and downgrade aggressive rhetoric. I guess this is all. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Sheng Zheng, Senior Researcher at the Organization for Regional and Inter-Regional Studies at Waseda University. And he's going to be speaking, well, taking a slightly more historical perspective on uh, China-Russia relations, but in the Q&A he's very happy also to talk about more contemporary relations between the, the two powers as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bra, uh, and thank you uh, for uh, the staff in Temple University uh, for this good opportunity to be here with you. Uh, as I have been in Japan for many years, somehow I am Japaneseized. Uh, at first, I would like to make an apology because uh, I'm not a specialist in in Russia. I'm just a, a specialized in China, uh, contemporary China, Chinese history. So I would like to uh, start my uh, to uh, talk something about uh, the well I forgot to <laughs> yeah uh, something about uh, the Soviet Union's influence on China's public perception on other nations the uh, which is focus on uh, uh, historical perspective and my main question is uh, how did the Sino-Soviet relationship affect China's public perception of other nations. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, we would uh, all understand that uh, historical perspective uh, usually affect people very deeply. Somehow you can say uh, international 
politics is the result of uh, the interaction between country, the, uh, many countries. But uh, still, uh, once a kind of image had formed, uh, this kind of image which is against other countries, it, it is usually not very easy to be uh, changed. So uh, in the case of Ch uh, in China, I would like to see, uh, we would like to see how the things happened in during the 1950s. Would I like to focus on the learn from the Soviet Union uh, campaign? So uh, let's take a quick look at what happened uh, in the 1950s. Well, a lot of people will say that uh, during the first beginning, uh, China has uh, finished the civil war in 1949 uh, the People's Republic of China had established, and then uh, China joined uh, the socialism uh, side and become one uh, of the Soviet Union's allies. Then China, in order to be a modern country, it learned from, uh, launched a campaign to learn from the Soviet Union in order to build a very strong uh, socialism uh, nation. So uh, the main purpose of this is two, I can s say. One is learn ideal and a special mechanism applied in the Soviet Union to, uh, to establish, establish socialism system. And the second is uh, to acquire large number of aid in economic and educational and military as in uh, this kind of aspects. Uh, this is, uh, uh, can be uh, said about uh, this kind of campaign. And uh, the post, uh, which is said, uh, Soviet is our model, this is usually used in, at that time, in the 1950s. Uh, during that time, uh, more than 10,000 Soviet specialists dispatched to China uh, throughout uh, 1950s. There's uh, a lot of people, and uh, you can see there are the Soviet specialists in Dalian Railway Factory in 1953, many people. Uh, was dispatched, and uh, they have worked closely with Chinese uh, workers and uh, technologists. Uh, there are a lot of warm stories about that. But uh, even when they want to do this, uh, but the Chinese government know it's very uh, difficult. Uh, only simply just launch a uh, campaign, just to try to do ever try to learn everything from Soviet Union, uh, unless. The Chinese people have a uh, uh, warm feeling, have a uh, close feeling about the Soviet Union. But so far, before 1949, that uh, the Chinese people do not have a close relationship with people in Soviet Union. The, that kind of thing, which can be said as uh, exchange, only limited uh, between CCP and uh, uh, the Communist Party of Soviet Union. So. Uh, at the beginning of 1950, even when the Korean War broke out, uh, you can find a lot of uh, words among university in Shanghai. Uh, those people, those professors saying, why we just uh, make friends with Soviet Union? Because Soviet Union even can make, cannot make a pen, a good pen. But compared with the US, uh, s such kind of things a lot you can heard from those uh, materials in archives. And uh, even uh, in Shanghai, people still in, in early 1950 and 1951 enjoy the movie from America and enjoy the pop, pop culture from America. So they just do, do not understand the meaning why to, we should learn from the US, uh, learn from the Soviet Union. So this is a very good, uh, huge barrier between China and the Soviet Union. So this, uh, in order to uh, erase this kind of a barrier, so they launched the Learn From the Soviet Union. So we can say that in Learn From the Soviet Union has two kind of aspects. One is acquire the aid, the economic aid from the Soviet Union. And the other side is just uh, want to, uh, to encourage the people mentally. So how did the people do that? Uh, the Chinese government uh, would uh, uh, do things in the four aspects. The first thing is exchange of visits. Uh, they sent a lot of scientists to uh, 
uh, Soviet Union uh, writers and art uh, artists to learn how great the Soviet Union is. And at the same time, Soviet Union also sent a lot of uh, scientists, writers, and artists to China. Uh, this has uh, changed uh, with each other uh, very closely. And this also, you can find uh, many, many uh, warm stories about that. I think warm, it simply should be cold, uh, coded. And the second, uh, maybe you, some of you have read the, star, uh, the novels, which one is How the Steel Was Tempered. Uh, at, during that time, a lot of Soviet uh, novels and movies introduced uh, to China. And these uh, stories has uh, allowed the passion among Chinese young uh, people. They want to uh, sacrifice themselves, especially the people, uh, the hero, uh, the hero in the novel story, how the uh, still was tempered, uh, Bor Kachashin. And uh, he has set a model for these young people. You should sacrifice for the whole country, for your, for your country, for the communist, uh, communism. And before that, also uh, Chin Chinese people have written some story, some novel story about uh, uh, to educate young people. But uh, you have to admit that Bao uh, Kachashin has a very strong uh, strength to move people. And the second is uh, the Soviet magazine, this, uh, which one is the Soviet Union. We can see uh, in the next picture this kind of thing, this kind of magazine called uh, Su Lian. And this was issued in 1952, uh, September. And this is the opening of Lenin Volga Dong Shipping ca Canal. And this is a picture of the standing statue. Also, you can find a lot of uh, numbers of introduction essay written by famous scientists in China. And these kind of things uh, written by such, uh, very famous scientists such as uh, Chen Qishen and uh, Li Siguang. They tried to put everything, uh, praise everything in Soviet Union, the scientists and the technology. But when you have uh, scrutinized all these paper in the, uh, written by them, you will find uh, in order to praise the everything in Soviet Union, they said that uh, the paper, uh, the science and technology in the U.S. is, is, is very, is very low, uh, is very low. And uh, because Chen Qishen and uh, Chen, uh, Chen Sanqiang and uh, Li Siguang, they also have received, many of these people received their education from the Western countries, especially in, in America or Britain. So you will wonder how in, in what kind of situation they written such a paper. But because they are distinguished scholars uh, in what, what, worldwide, so their papers are, uh, were widely read and uh, uh, believed. And uh, let's go to the magazine. Not only uh, about, uh, yes, the, it's still the, uh, Soviet Union magazine, this is a part of the Soviet uh, magazines. In this kind of magazine, the Soviet, uh, the people, uh, the editor want to convince all the people in China that uh, the people in Soviet Union lead a very good life. You can see from these pictures, uh, a man that uh, driving his private car in Moscow uh, to a sub suburb to enjoy his weekend. It was issued in 1952 and uh, you can see another picture, it's very good, uh, in his own private car. But uh, you know, in Shanghai, which is now is called as the first uh, top class international city by Shanghainese nowadays. But uh, in 1953, there are only 4,000 cars uh, under the traffic bureau in Shanghai to support the public service. So to own a private car, it's very, very hard to imagine. So if the Chinese people, you can imagine what kind of strong impact they receive from these kind of magazine. So uh, all of these pictures, all of these posts, uh, uh, repeat again and again, day and again. So uh, a lot of people would say in Chinese from the bottom of their heart, Su Lian de Jintian Jiu Shi Wo Bda Mingtian. Uh, means the Soviet Union today will be our tomorrow, something like that. But uh, well, 
uh, it seems that all of these have been uh, uh, very successful because uh, even nowadays, my, you know, my mother, my father learned they are Russia during 1950s. And uh, when I was a child, uh, I remember uh, when my mother was in a very good mood, she will uh, sing, some, uh, sing some Russia songs when she learned when she was young. Uh, it was uh, always keep me very curious because I know that China and the Soviet Union split just uh, uh, in the early 1960s. But how, why do my mother still sing such songs and in a very good mood, seems very enjoy that moment. Uh, and uh, I have also looked at many people uh, at my mother's age. I, you can say that their feeling about the Soviet Union is not, is not fake. They are true. They like the Soviet Union. Something you can call as a nostalgia uh, emotion, but it's real and it, it does exist in their heart. So well, this uh, always uh, bothered me and I watch it on to think why these kind of things uh, happen. Well, maybe uh, you can say two things about this. One is uh, this kind of learn from the Soviet Union greatly assisted to improve the Soviet Union's image among Chinese people, this is for sure. But however, as I said, it did not save the, uh, the Sino-Soviet relationship from split. Uh, when Mao Zedong and uh, Khrushchev, they split, they say goodbye to each other. Nobody, especially I mean the numerous normal people, did not, could not do anything to, to prevent this. They just say, oh, what happened? And they have to receive the, the reality. So how to uh, see uh, these kind of things? And uh, as I have uh, written some paper on the Learn from, China, uh, Learn from Soviet Union during the 1950s, well, you can see that uh, there are such kind of uh, campaign was uh, carried out uh, what, uh, the nationwide uh, and it uh, continued for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I, you, I'm allowed, uh, I'm given t one hour, I can share a lot of stories with you. It's, it's very uh, amazing, something like that. But, uh, Still, uh, with these, seeing these, scrutinize these kind of stories, you will see that there are very strong instruction from the CCP leadership. And that is say, this is something top down, not from the bottom really, uh, not, the normal people did not volunteer to join it, and they did not uh, do it uh, independently. And uh, at the same time, this kind of launch uh, was carried out in a closed environment without information from outside. So, uh, just as uh, introduced uh, uh, earlier, uh, the famous art scientists, uh, they introduced the great achievements uh, in the Soviet Union, but without introducing anything, which is now happening in the US, in the Britain. So people would like say, to believe all the things they heard is the truth. Uh, and uh, this uh, such kind of things repeated day after day, they were, uh, and they eventually they become uh, the reality. And also, uh, the Chinese intellectuals cooperation in building Soviet good image. Uh, this is a famous, uh, the well-known uh, something, uh, Leshkov season, and the suppression of genetics, because uh, this is uh, denied. Uh, at first, in 1950s, it was wel welcomed in Chinese uh, society, but later, it also had been denied. Uh, things like that. Uh, so, but, uh, well, let's uh, go back to the first uh, beginning, what I had, uh, my question. What kind of influence had these kind of things uh, in, uh, affected Chinese people? We can say that uh, this kind of uh, uh, learn from Soviet Union is uh, the first time of the wholesale importation of another society's organizational and ideological blueprint. Uh, even try to, uh, before 1950, China tried to westernize, they learned from the, the US, but not so thoroughly, you can imagine. And because they have invaded from, uh, by the Japanese, the uh, Chinese people have a uh, feeling they're very nervous about uh, the other, uh, uh, the foreign outside. 
So uh, this is the first time, and uh, this is the last time that uh, China tried to embrace the influence from outside thoroughly, totally, uh, in each aspect, but it failed. So a lot of people uh, feel very frustrated. As uh, uh, the picture, this is a page of a young people diary in 1950s. I followed the, these people's uh, pic uh, picture, uh, this diary. Many people in China, uh, many people uh, studies on this period, they just focused how great, how kind of influence, such as the novel uh, had influenced the Chinese people. They try to analyze, focus on, focus on analyzing the influence of the novels or the economic aid. But uh, how do the normal people see what happened during the, through the 10 years? There are not so many materials. So these days I'm just focusing uh, see on the diaries. And uh, it's not a such a simple thing. At the first beginning, uh, so many young, many young people, they just uh, refused to accept the influence of the Soviet Union as to as the reading I have referred to before. And gradually, gradually, uh, day by day, is, and they have uh, accepted. But uh, at the end, all of them seem to be a lie. So they are greatly frustrated. And then uh, it comes to the last conclusion. Then uh, even nowadays, you can see a, a kind of feeling which is distrust. Feel my own country is isolated is surrounded by other countries because once you embrace and once you treat it, uh, no matter what kind of the reason, uh, this uh, maybe we can say something uh, a very deep rooted in the bottom of the heart uh, because of that kind of the history. Okay, I will stop here, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's so interesting to hear about that earlier period of uh, Sino-Soviet friendship at a time when, again, there was so much talk about the closeness of relations between Beijing and, and Moscow. Uh, although perhaps this time around, it seems to be perhaps more top-down rather than more sort of uh, grassroots. Okay, so uh, last and certainly least, um, I'm going to be speaking about uh, Japan's relations uh, with Russia in 2018. I, I do have some slides, hopefully, there. Um, but to start off with, I think uh, many of you will know that Prime Minister Abe has made it a real priority of his uh, to push forward relations with Russia, and this has been really quite consistent, uh, especially since 2016 when he introduced his new approach to relations with Russia also announcing an eight-point economic cooperation plan. Some people have thought that perhaps this might already be running out of steam, but in fact, through some of Prime Minister Abe's comments since the beginning of this year, it seems that in fact he's going to continue very forcefully to push forward with this project. Now, uh, there are two particular quotes, which I'm hoping will appear any moment now, uh, which uh, highlighted this. Now, first of all, Prime Minister Abe has spoken about 2018 as being his year of action, the year in which the plans that were set out in previous times, especially related to the election, ah, hooray, so uh, will actually come into effect. So here's the, the quotation itself at the top here. This year is the year of putting our plans into execution. We will transition the policies we pledged during the 2017 general election into execution one by one. Now, for the most part, this has been interpreted to be about other policies, also to be about constitutional revision. I think that's right. But this second quotation you can see on the slide seems to indicate that also perhaps he sees 2018 as a year where perhaps some progress can be made in relations with Russia. And this is a very interesting quote from um, when he was engaged in opening the new parliamentary session. In our relations with other countries, relations with Russia have the greatest number of opportunities. 
we will successively, one by one, begin to implement the agreements we have reached with Russia, and on this basis, the territorial problem will be resolved, and a Japan-Russia peace treaty will be signed. So, this is not a leader who is giving up on his plans for relations with Russia. It's an extraordinarily optimistic statement. So, what perhaps are uh, the precise plans of the Japanese leader? Well, one of the areas of definite focus relates to the joint economic activities on the disputed islands. Now, this seems to be where Abe is pla placing a lot of his emphasis, and they believe that perhaps they've got a chance of some significant progress. So, uh, these uh, joint economic activities, the agreement to talk about these was the main thing to come out of Putin's visit to Japan in December 2016. As you might remember, this was seen as being far from an overwhelming success, but this was the main kind of significant thing to come out of it. Russia agreed to talk about this issue. Since then, they've made some further apparent progress with the agreement when Abe went to Vladivostok in September last year to focus on five priority areas. Uh, it's to do with aquaculture, uh, greenhouse vegetable cultivation, uh, tourism, wind power, and uh, garbage volume reduction measures. Always a sexy topic. Uh, the content of these is less important than the, uh, the arrangements which would be required for them to take place. These are important because of their symbolic significance, not because of what they actually involve. And the reason why this is so significant is because the Japanese side have placed as a precondition that these activities would have to take place under a special legal framework which would not contradict Japan's claims to sovereignty over the islands. So they would have to come up with some special legal mechanism which would mean that it wasn't contradictory to Japan's claims. So that essentially means that they would have to take place outside of the normal framework of Russian law. So, if they can get agreement on this, it means that Russia would be seen to have made a concession on the issue of sovereignty. Clearly, Russia wouldn't be recognizing Japanese sovereignty, but they would be giving Japan, it would seem, a foothold onto the islands, which they could subsequently use for perhaps pushing for something more favorable. In addition, this would enable the return of a Japanese presence to the islands in a kind of semi-permanent way for the first time in many, many decades. And again, this could, they think, perhaps be a first stage towards something more significant. Uh, the, the picture you've got there relates to uh, a joint survey visit uh, which took place, two of these took place last year, and that's the one which uh, occurred during the summer when they were looking at potential sites for these projects. So it seems to be moving forward and some of this is my guesswork, but it seems that there are potential hopes for a number of additional steps forward this year. Next month, there are talks which are going to take place at a deputy foreign minister level and to try and work out the specific contents of these projects and also the logistical issues involved, which I think involves this most important legal question. I've also highlighted there that the Russian presidential election is obviously coming up in March, specifically March the 18th, and this is seen as relevant also because there are hopes from some on the Japanese side that after the election of Putin, as we're all expecting, during his final term, he might be willing to be a bit more open to compromise on this issue. That at least is the, is the hope. Okay, so. Putin's re-elected, we all expect, unless there's a, a rather kind of surprising shift. Uh, Putin's re-elected, and then they go forward with a meeting of the foreign ministers uh, in Japan. I put actually foreign ministers there instead of Lavrov and Kono because there's a, there's a rumor, and it is only a rumor, that Lavrov might be replaced after the election. But um, I heard it from one of your colleagues, actually. So, um, but... <laughs> Um, that's a, a possibility, that's in the spring, and that's paving the way for 
an expected visit by Abe to Russia in May. Now, uh, each year, as well as the Eastern Economic Forum held in Vladivostok, uh, Russia holds uh, its main sort of economic forum in St. Petersburg. And each year, for the last three years, I think, they've had like a special uh, country which is identified as their special sort of guest. And this year, it's Japan. And so, Prime Minister Abe has been invited to attend that event in St. Petersburg, and it's going to be followed, it seems, by him attending the opening ceremony at the Bolshoi Ballet of the uh, Japan-Russia Crossroads Year. Um, there's not really a good term for it in English, but it's the, the year of Japan in Russia, year of Russia in Japan. And then um, it's also expected that perhaps Putin would visit uh, Japan uh, next year in May, uh, there's also the G20 in uh, Japan next year, and so Putin might be expected to visit that. Um, uh, it might even therefore be two visits. Okay, so the hope is that by means of these meetings, something can actually be achieved definitely on the joint economic activities. In particular, there's been some talk about during Abe's visit to Russia in May, a sort of framework agreement could be signed on the joint economic activities, which would require them to have actually sorted out this legal issue. Okay, so that's the hopes. How's it gonna work out? Well, any of you who've uh, heard me speak about Japan-Russia relations will know um, that I tend to take a very pessimistic view. I'm not at all convinced that there's gonna be progress on this issue. And um, I also am not at all sure that um, this legal framework can be agreed. So will Russia agree to a legal framework distinct from Russian law? This would be a major concession from the Russian side, allowing Japanese companies to operate on the islands outside of Russian law. And uh, there have been some prominent uh, Russian officials who have really questioned this. Indeed. On the day when this agreement to talk about the joint economic activities was announced, on the 15th of December 2016, Ushakov, who's the, the chief foreign policy aide of Putin, immediately poured cold water on it, asked whether these could, uh, would be based on Russian legislation under Russian law. He said, of course, since it's Russia's territory. Also, there's been some criticism within the Russian media about this agreement, that it could be Japan's Trojan horse to get an initial kind of entry point into these islands and then to use that for further kind of influence. Also criticism of it being a form of extraterritoriality and inconsistent with Russia's constitution. Further to this, what about, oh, that's not turned out right. Uh, but um, you've just got it twice there, but uh, public opinion uh, on this issue. So it uh, is asking uh, the public, uh, what is your opinion about the Kuril problem? Um, should the islands be transferred to Japan? That's the 5%. The should they be used uh, together with Japan? So that seems to be the joint economic activities option, supported by 6%. And then that overwhelming majority, 89%, said that the islands should remain Russian. So um, there seems to be a lot of public opposition to even the joint economic activities, let alone um, a transfer to Japan. What else is problematic in the relationship? Well, Aegis Ashore is enormously problematic. The issue of THAAD was mentioned by Anna, and uh, Russia did make some statements in criticism of THAAD, but the criticism of Aegis Ashore has been much, much stronger. And you might have seen uh, reported in the English language media the comments by Lavrov. Those were the most recent ones, uh, saying, our US counterparts have been saying we have nothing to worry about, that all that is not against us, but there is solid evidence this is not so. We've heard Japan will control this system, while the United States will have nothing to do with it at all, but we have serious doubts this will be really so. So seeing this very much as being part of the US missile defense system that Russia believes is deliberately surrounding uh, Russian territory. But I draw your attention to these other comments because I think they're in some ways even stronger. So Deputy Foreign Minister Ryabkov in December saying Aegis Ashore creates a new situation 
which we logically must take account in our military planning. That sounds like another way of saying we could potentially target these with our, um, with our missiles. Once again, we urge our Japanese colleagues to reflect on whether it is in their interest to become complicit in violation of the INF Treaty. Now, what's going on there is that the Russian side also believes that Aegis Ashur has offensive uses, and therefore, if it were used for offensive purposes, it could potentially constitute a violation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And then also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokeswoman Zakharova, who always has a, a lively turn of phrase, uh, she says, actions like these are in direct contradiction to the priority of building military and political trust between Russia and Japan, and unfortunately will impact in a negative way on the whole atmosphere in bilateral relations, including negotiations over the peace treaty problem. So it's extraordinary that Abe remains so optimistic in that comment that I included at the beginning, when the, the official spokeswoman for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is saying, you know, this pours cold water on peace treaty negotiations and by connection on the discussion about joint economic activities. Also, on the Russian side, a lot of attention has gone to some recent comments by Defense Minister Onodera. In particular, this story, which was covered in both the Nikkei Asian Review and also in the Nikkei itself, uh, where Onodera is quoted as saying, not only can Aegis Ashur be used against ballistic missiles, there is also the possibility of adding the function of intercepting cruise missiles. To protect the people from various missile threats, I want to proceed with the necessary studies. Okay, so the comment itself is perhaps not entirely problematic because he could say that or oh, various missile threats means various missile threats from North Korea but the headline of the article um, is uh, Japan expanding missile defense with eye on China and Russia and within the article there were several comments about cruise missile threats from Russia and China and when this came out uh, a colleague uh, from a Russian university contacted me and said, what do the Japanese side mean by this? Why are they openly suggesting that Aegis Ashur is directed uh, towards China and Russia? So I'm not entirely sure how to interpret this story. It could be that um, it's simply that uh, Mr. Onodera's intentions were entirely different and that the story was reported in a different way than was intended. But that certainly is another way in which Aegis Ashur has really caused some anger from the Russian side. Okay, and this is my final slide now, which is um, just a broader point about the territorial dispute. One of the reasons why I've always taken a pessimistic view about the chances of Japan getting a deal is because I think that the status quo seems to favor Russia so much. Russia, as you know, administers all of the islands at present. And also, whilst that situation remains the case, there is an incentive for, well, at least a leader like Prime Minister Abe, to pursue closer political and economic ties with Russia in an attempt to create dynamism in the relationship, to um, have the hope that that would ultimately lead to some sort of breakthrough. If the islands issue were actually resolved, would that interest be maintained from the Japanese side? I think you could say that there would be a fair chance that perhaps it wouldn't. There is the hope, however, that Russia would be persuaded by the desire to finally get a peace treaty. But actually, from my reading of the comments of Russian officials and what Russian academics say on this, there's no great priority from the Russian side. They're not really that bothered about a peace treaty. That the main reason why there is limited Japanese investment within Russia is not because of the absence of the peace treaty, it's rather because of issues to do with the economic climate and also in part, I suppose, the, uh, the consequence of the US's uh, difficult relations uh, with Russia. So overall, despite Prime Minister Abe's enormous enthusiasm, his uh, willingness to continue with this policy, I think that 2018, like previous years, will feature a number of disappointments for the Japanese side. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, please. 
Uh, Father Paul Koroluk, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Kiev Patriarchate. Uh, Professor uh, Kiriva, in your presentation, you mentioned or stated that there, Russia is a strong proponent of the non-proliferation regime and several times emphasized that Russia wishes people to respect the UN. A little over two decades ago, a newly independent Ukraine rather reluctantly gave up its nuclear weapons, becoming only the second nation on the planet to voluntarily give up its nuclear weapons, signing the Budapest Memorandum in which the United States, England, and Russia guaranteed the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. Whatever words Russia might use, its ongoing occupation and war against Ukraine does not that teach North Korea and other such nations that they had better get and keep nuclear weapons as soon as possible, and also that Russian promises really don't mean much. Thank you. I think perhaps m m was more of a comment than a question, but would you like to respond? Okay. <laughs> That was intended as a question, yeah. <laughs> but, but what was the question? Okay. Uh, but what was the question? Uh, the well, question was you given... To, you have to hold it down. Mm -hmm. think. Well, use this one. Yeah. Hi. What you yeah? D despite your statements, do yeah. not Russia's own actions encourage nations such as North Korea mm -hmm. that they should be getting in keeping nuclear weapons if they want to preserve their territorial integrity? And doesn't Russia's ignoring of the Budapest Memorandum, ignoring of the UN condemnation of the annexation of Crimea in the ongoing war in East Ukraine, in fact teach against those words that Russia's promises really don't mean much? Uh, thank you for your question. I should say for North Korea, uh, what is of much more importance is the Libyan example. Uh, the North Korean experts mostly point to uh, what happened with Muammar Gaddafi <coughs> after he decided to abandon nuclear weapons and uh, specifically about the US and NATO uh, involvement into the Libyan case as the example of what could happen with them and with the leadership specifically uh, if North Korea abandons uh, nuclear weapons. So North Koreans mostly focus on this particular example. In the second part of that, Russia's ign ignoring of the Budapest Memorandum and UN resolutions regarding Korea. Well, I... Do, do, how, do, yeah. how would that give a, a country such as North Korea or Japan any confidence that Russia would, a bit, would honor for the, any agreements in the future? Uh, I'm here not to discuss yeah. Russia and Ukraine issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a specialist on East Asia. Mm -hmm. But from Russia's perspective, what has been happening in Ukraine was not caused by Russia, but by actions of uh, the US and Europe uh, in Ukraine. So uh, this is completely another case. This is from Russia's perspective. My name is Martin Kölling. I'm a journalist from Germany, um, <coughs> and I cover North Korea from time to time. Um, one issue uh, in your presentation, and maybe also the, your, the other can comment on it, is uh, the, basically the perception of the North Korean motivation to develop nuclear weapons. China and Russia emphasize the deterrence, the deterrent aspect. But if you look uh, a bit closer on North Korean propaganda, this is merely a kind of tactical issue. Uh, what do you think about, uh, isn't the uh, one strategic goal for nuclear weapons um, that is always mentioned in North Korea itself, uh, to use basically the increased military power to drive the United States out of the, uh, from the peri uh, Korean Peninsula and unify Korea under North Korean leadership. Mm. And if this is the strategic goal, and it is missing in the Russian, basically, in the Russian um, yeah, analysis uh, of, the, of uh, the situation, what does it mean for, um, isn't that a serious lack in the analysis? And, do you think that uh, Russia needs a different approach um, 
to solve the uh, issue on the uh, no Korean Peninsula. Mm. Uh, th thank you very much for your question. Um, so um, I should um, divide the answer into several parts. Um, Russia's expert mostly um, who communicate mostly with North Koreans uh, say that what North Korea wants to achieve is deterrence, meaning that they want to, prev to, to um, prevent the regime change. Uh, and especially the leadership and Kim Jong Un want to, to, to have the regime in place. Um, and uh, probably uh, they believe, I mean, as a dictatorship, as a, 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 a dictator state, uh, it matters a lot and probably it's not only propaganda, but uh, actually the survival of the regime and of the Kim clan is, is really of utmost importance to North Korea. Um, and uh, um, as you uh, mentioned, uh, Russian experts do agree that um, North Korea doesn't really know what to do with these nuclear weapons uh, arsenal and with this nuclear weapons stock that it has been developing. Uh, meaning that if you have nuclear weapons, you need at least to clarify what are your intentions. And uh, we cannot really see that North Koreans have clarified, for example, that they are not going to threaten uh, forceful unifi uh, unification of the peninsula. Just that what you said. Um, uh, most Russian experts, uh, well, at least the mainstream of Russian experts, of Russian Korean experts, uh, believe that um, North Korea is extremely highly unlikely uh, to attack first. Uh, North Korean leadership t uh, doesn't want to commit suicide. And it would be a suicide. I mean, for North Korea, if North Korea attacks, uh, for example, South Korea, it would be a suicide anyway for North Korean leadership. Uh, so, so probably it won't attack first. Uh, the other problem is that there could be uh, a spiral of um, hostile actions and aggressive rhetorics, which could lead into, s um, I don't know, several s or some contingencies, which could be something that could be interpreted by North Korea as endangering its regime, and North Korea could uh, answer somehow more provocative than it usually does, and the US could interpret it uh, as um, like um, hostile military action and some military action could start actually because of that. Uh, so uh, this is concerned by most Russian experts as uh, one of the um, probable scenarios, uh, one of the difficult scenarios that can happen um, and, c and could turn into hostile actions. Um, and um, um, actually um, it is, uh, well, rather unlikely that North Korea would um, do some like um, would invade South Korea using nuclear weapons. Uh, I guess most Russian experts believe that it is uh, rather unlikely because just a as I previously mentioned, um, after that North Korean regime would su would survive for how long, for how many hours or days after that. Uh, so probably it's not n not North Korea that would first do some things. However, as I said, there is a threat of maybe blackmail or uh, just these threats. And um, well, we need to deal with these threats uh, somehow. And as I mentioned, Russia believes that we should negotiate and uh, well, engage North Korea as well, not only put pressure on it. Thank you for your question. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not qualified to answer your question because I'm not, uh, well, uh, actually there are a lot of conflicts, uh, especially in Xinjiang, uh, uh, between, in because of uh, the occupation of uh, the Russia and the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, how about uh, the Chinese learn from, uh, well, I think that uh, uh, the nationalism policy is, uh, China has uh, its own national uh, policy, especially on the, on the w how to say that uh, the, the people with uh, uh, minors uh, and uh, uh, in Soviet Union, as I know that in Soviet Union, they tried to uh, uni uh, unify all of the people uh, to try to uh, let them uh, learn the Russians, but in China, uh, people would uh, like to uh, 
to aid to uh, support uh, these people in uh, Xinjiang and in other areas. And they tried very hard to, but somehow, because uh, the limited information, we, I just do not know much things about what had happened there now, uh, at that, uh, there. But uh, in the late 1980s, so many Chinese scholars, uh, uh, they try to reflect, they want to uh, learn the lesson from the collapse of the Soviet Union. So maybe the people in China do not think the national uh, policy uh, on this uh, 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 ethnic policy is not a successful uh, example for China. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. Back to the fast bowling then. So yes, sir, please. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Alan Hulse, and I'm a tourist visiting and happy to be here today. Um, I have a question about the 1951 San Francisco Treaty. Probably my question is directed to Professor Brown. Um, in the 1951 San Francisco Treaty, Japan relinquished its claims to uh, Sakhalin uh, from the 50th parallel south and the Kuril Islands. Um, this, and, and Japan has always maintained that it never meant Hopodiodo as part of that uh, relinquishment in the treaty. Relinquishing this territory uh, was clearly in the uh, interest of the Soviet Union uh, as its military was already there by the time of the signing of the treaty and uh, the United States had no uh, way of uh, filling a, a vacuum in that uh, territory. Presumably it was taken by the Russians physically, uh, militarily, uh, to create a buffer zone against northern en encroachment from the United States. Uh, at whose behest was that inclusion in the treaty to, for Japan to relinquish those territories uh, if it were clearly in the benefit of the Russians who never signed that treaty anyway? That's my question. Thank you. So um, you have to mention the, uh, the Yalta Declaration um, because in the Yalta Declaration, in return for entering the war against Japan, the Soviet Union was was promised uh, Sakhalin and uh, the Kuril Islands. So for that reason, the uh, San Francisco Treaty, even though it seemingly deliberately didn't define uh, the Kuril Islands, it um, was influenced in its structure, in what was included by the Yalta Declaration. Uh, no, from the from the Japanese side, as you as you suggested, uh, despite the fact that it says that Japan relinquishes all claim to the Kuril Islands, um, they hold the position that the four disputed islands are, are not part of the Kuril chain. In fact, they are a separate uh, geological geographical entity, which, as you say, is, is known as the the Northern Territories. Now, in my view, that's one of the weakest parts of Japan's claim that it seems to be uh, a post hoc um, way of getting out of the difficulty of the, the San Francisco uh, Peace Treaty. Uh, you can also mention, though, that since the Soviet Union didn't sign it, since it's never mentioned to whom the islands are relinquished, perhaps that does strengthen Japan's case a little bit, but it is definitely problematic for the Japanese claim, especially because there are Japanese officials who have said uh, around that time, and it's not just one case, that uh, the, uh, the two larger of the islands are part of the Kuril chain. So as I say, I think that's a, a serious weakness in, in Japan's territorial claim. Thank you. I'm um, Jasper Edman from Stotsbach University, and my uh, question is for Professor Kiriva. Uh, thank you for outlining uh, Russia's stance on, on the North Korean situation. Um, I had one question, which is how can Russia take a bigger role in these talks? And how can it um, get the other powers to listen to itself uh, or to its position? Because as you said, Russia is kind of a minor position. Um, what you're outlining doesn't really seem to be anything new and it, no specific proposal. So what's, what's, what does Russia bring to the table? What's its leverage to actually get this done? Um, the one thing that I could think of 
uh, is perhaps the Kuril Islands, which Professor Brown mentioned, but uh, Professor Brown s seemed to think that that was not really an option. So I'm wondering how can actually Russia get this done? Thank you for your question. Uh, this is a very tricky issue, exactly. Uh, as Russia wants to play the role of a kind of an intermediary or mediator, you need at first that some parties agree to be mediated. If they do not agree, you may not act a mediator. And this is a problem, especially with the US leadership now, um, and uh, with, um, with Japan as well, who is not, uh, which, is not, which thinks that it's now not time to talk, it's time to apply more pressure. Um, so of course here the issue is uh, whether uh, the sides could be uh, brought to the table, to the negotiations table. And the major parties here, of course, are uh, the US, China, and South Korea, with North Korea. Uh, probably Russia and Japan, they both play, uh, well, uh, uh, not that important role uh, if we compare to other parties. Um, however, um, what I find interesting is that Japan has something to benefit from Russia's proposal for, for six-party talks. Um, and um, well, um, if you ask for <coughs> specific Russian proposals, uh, there are proposals on expert level. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure uh, what are the proposals the, pr the proposals from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, except for this roadmap, because the Minister officially has been always pointing to the roadmap. And uh, the first thing is perhaps downgrading aggressive rhetorics and this dual freeze uh, meaning of, of, of uh, freezing the um, nuclear missile <coughs> tests and stopping for some time the exercises. Um, so uh, I know that there are uh, sp other measures, for example, that are proposed by experts. Um, for instance, um, this could be halt of new, uh, North Korean missile programs, uh, missile program, and uh, the U.S. Um, decision not to deploy s strategic assets to South Korea, like uh, B-1 bombers, like um, nuclear submarines, for example. Uh, this could be a thing that, for example could be negotiated um, and uh, basically uh, Russia still uh, endorses this moratorium for moratorium agenda meaning that um, we need to, to, to make some concessions from both sides uh, at least in order to uh, negotiate and of course uh, if I mean if the US is not willing to have talks uh, because what North Koreans want is direct talks with the US anyway um, it's very unlikely that Russia could play a such a mediator role. However, uh, the potential here could be that if US tries to, to negotiate bilateral with North Korea and finds that it's very difficult objectively to, um, to negotiate anything, then a mediator could be a good idea. And Russia now is a unique position that North Korea would better uh, will work with Russia than with China probably uh, over this issue because um, well, North Koreans um, more appreciate that Russia could act as uh, this well kind of honest intermediary, meaning taking into consideration at least partly North Korean concer uh, concerns as well. But of course, unless all other parties do not want to talk and North Koreans, uh, we, we, we may not actually enforce them. That's why South-North Korean dialogue is seen very positively and could be a start for something, uh, at, at least if the Olympics takes place, if North Korea participates. And for this time, the exercise, the South Korean US exercise are postponed till the end of the Olympics at least. It could be a window of opportunity. Okay, thank you. David Satterwhite, I have the opportunity to be uh, adjunct here in teaching uh, Northeast Asian and Korean uh, politics. Uh, my question actually follows closely on the one that was just asked. Um, and so you've already covered some of the territory that I had in mind, but uh, Professor Kariva. Um, I was struck by the pragmatic and very realistic uh, perception of the, of, the, of the Korean Peninsula, including taking into consideration uh, North Korea's perceptions and position, uh, which is often not um, uh, directly addressed. Um, and that leads me to uh, point out something of the irony, you might say, or the, the paradigm 
of United Nations sanctions. Um, the sanctions were to prevent uh, the nuclearization and, and, uh, or now to enforce the denuclearization of the, uh, the North Korean uh, program, both missiles and nuclear uh, weapons. The logic, of course, is uh, that um, further sanctions and sanctions and sanctions have to be applied until the, uh, the ultimate objective. But um, um, President Putin has also pointed out it's very unlikely that North Korea will uh, accept those, and they would prefer, I think he said, to eat grass than to um, give up the nuclear weapons. The, presum the presumption of United Nations sanctions that the United, uh, sorry, that Russia also agrees to um, <coughs> is that there is hostile intent mm -hmm. by North Korea. But the logic that you've also described, taking into consideration the reasons that North Korea has developed a nuclear program and a missile capability, possibly ICBM and miniaturization, um, the logic is that it's a deterrent force. I happen to believe that it is indeed deterrent, and it would take longer to go into great detail. Um, but there seems to be something of a, a quandary. The Soviet, uh, sorry, Russia. Russia Sorry. voting on behalf of, very yes, very, very, sorry, I'll make it quick. Uh, Russia, on the one hand, um, very much voting with the United Nations sanctions, yet not wishing to see a destabilization and regime change and the vacuum that would create, uh, and yet needing to propose the, um, the point of view from the, from the uh, North Koreans that indeed this is a deterrent force. I'm just um, asking for some way to uh, solve the dilemma between these two somewhat contradictory um, positions. Sorry, that was not articulated very clearly. But. Um, I'm sorry. As far as I understood, the question was about the dilemma uh, that, for on the one hand, Russia takes sanctions. And um, ac um, as one of the UN Security Council permanent members votes for the sanctions. Yes. At the other hand, it says that North Korean concerns should also be taken into consideration. And will not give up its nuclear weapons um, with further sanctions. So mm -hmm. It's the question, why does Russia even support the sanctions? That would be one way to ask the question. Ah, Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, well, uh, as I probably tried to say, th uh, Thank you very much for your question, I'm sorry. Uh, as, as I tried to say, um, Russia still believes that what North Korea does is a violation of uh, UN Security Council resolutions of non-proliferation regime uh, that should uh, anyway abandon nuclear weapons and that uh, its actions are provoking, uh, mm, uh, um, are leading to instability and escalation of the situation. So this irresponsible behavior must be sanctioned further. Uh, this is the general belief. Uh, the, um, the, the devil is in the details, so the devil is to what extent uh, the sanctions should work. And as you mentioned, uh, Russia hopes that, uh, that we, uh, and believes that we do not need like economic blockade, total economic blockade, because it would damage the population. Um, and uh, thus it still believes that such provocative behavior uh, needs to be punished and North Korea needs to be shown that it cannot go on and on, even in spite that it is itself is promoting negotiations. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is David Litt. I'm a professor at Keio University up the street. Um, but I don't follow this area um, closely, except as a you know private citizen. Um, I can rem and I, I, this is a question about the Northern Territories again, um, or the Southern Kuril Islands, um, I guess depending on your perspective. Um, it seemed to me before there was a meeting, I think Putin Abe meeting, maybe it was late 2016, um, around that time. Maybe it's when they set up that framework. Um, Yes, and it seemed that in hearing Japanese business people, you know, in passing before that meeting, they were being asked by the government to get all of their commercial deals ready to announce, and they thought Putin was going to bring this wonderful present of these islands, and they had to get everything lined up um, to get back, and it actually seemed like there was some thought that there might be 
um, that it might be easier for the Russians to, to actually um, resolve this issue. Um, uh, based on what you said, that was a very un unrealistic um, expectation, and, and in fact, it was dashed at that meeting. Um, and I guess my question is, looking that 90 percent of the Russian public opposes um, a major concession on the islands. Um, well, we also have heard that in the United States, something like 78 or 80 percent of the American public supports a resolution of the so-called dreamer immigration issue. But a lot of people don't think it's worth shutting down the government um, to get that resolution. Is this an issue like that in Russia where, where there's unanimity, but people don't care that much about it? And so there's some flexibility for, for Putin if he wants to, and he gets something in return, to, to trade it away, is, or, or is it like in Japan where I sense the right wing um, and, and the, the, uh, won't support a deal at all? Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I'll take that first and then uh, if you want to add yeah. a comment as well. My perception of it is that it's not a major issue most of the time in Russia because there's not believed to be any real danger that they're going to be transferred to Japan. If, however, that became a serious possibility, and during the 90s there were some concerns that that would happen, then I think you really would see some serious opposition from the Russian side. I mean, would, would that be your take on it? Mm, yeah. Uh, if I if I may add, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I I agree with this, and I should mention probably that Russia's perspective is another perspective. I mean, from Russia's perspective, um, th the problem has been that um, the relations have deteriorated for several uh, well for several years after the Ukrainian crisis, and uh, that the climate and the, this the actually the um, the climate of the relations is not favorable and uh, a peace treaty and uh, resolution of the territorial issue is rather a difficult thing and there have been negotiations for already for a long time and um, still there is a huge difference in positions and in order to make compromises because I mean uh, Russia that cannot accept Japanese position fully, Japan cannot accept Russian position, so actually to, in order to solve that we need to make some compromise. And we could do that only creating a favorable, um, I mean completely another atmosphere from of the relations from what we uh, had uh, just when Abe started all this and, um, um, and his uh, new approach to Russia in May 2016. And um, from Russia's perspective, uh, it is not that um, economic, um, I don't know, um, this, uh, creating this favorable atmosphere and favorable climate is not a thing that can be done in a year or half a year. It would take a much longer time uh, in order to do that. Um, and um, it, is, it would be very strange to see Russia compromising while Japan on the other side were adopted some sanctions. So, I mean, uh, there should be uh, much more vigorous economic context from the both sides, better security and political cooperation as well. So, and in these more favorable circumstances, both of us could actually think of some compromise. Um, and it's not that uh, we would give up islands for economic assistance. Japan is not going to provide economic assistance. It is that, uh, I mean, it is that uh, the business uh, is looking for some contracts. Uh, counterparts in Russia is being stimulated. But uh, it means that it's purely economic basis. If it's not profitable model, Japan business is not going to invest Anyway, so um, possibly from Russia's perspective, the approach uh, itself that Russia would compromise if given a lot of investment is fault. So the, uh, the approach m must be that we, w we need to, to build up uh, rigorous economic cooperation and security uh, political cooperation, and on that ground we could actually uh, do something uh, with uh, peace treaty and this territorial issue. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've got uh, not that much time left and several questions. So let's make sure to keep them short and keep them as actual questions rather than uh, comments. I'll Jonathan. Do I'll do my best, Professor Brown. All right, my name is uh, Jonathan Fryermuth. I'm a senior here at TJ. Um, thank you for th all three speakers for the illuminating um, perspectives and presentations. Um, I guess I have two questions, uh, but I'll start with a statement. Um, <laughs> right. so, in, so at the beginning of uh, Professor Kadiva's uh, presentation, she highlighted that 
uh, in the immediate term, the uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula is the biggest issue which, Russian, which Russia is facing in East Asia. But in my opinion, um, over the longer term, uh, actually it's China's rise that is going to become a bigger and bigger issue that Russia will have to deal with. So um, I would like to ask Professor Kiriva if um, what, what do you think is the likelihood, in your opinion, of in the next 10 or 20 years of a future um, Sino-Russo split, like a second Sino-Russo split? And maybe Professor Cheng can also get in Get, you know, uh, contribute a little bit on that too from maybe the Chinese perspective of how it could possibly happen because as you noted in your presentation, it was you know, a decade of building yep. up good Thank relations you. and then quick, quickly spiraling <laughs> downwards. We, and we've then got for, it. We've got for it Professor general. Brown, if that, <laughs> if, a, if that potentiality is, is likely, is it not um, crazy to think that Professor, uh, Professor Prime Minister Abe is uh, factoring in worse relations with China and Russia in the future, so currying favor, currying more favorable relations with Russia now, if that likelihood should happen, would actually make it better for Russia to kind of use Japan to play off China in the future if they create okay. favorable yeah, relations right it. now. Thank so. you. <laughs> Um, th thank you for your question uh, on China's rise. I will, I will try to answer sh a short way, though. It's a question for, I don't know, a separate conference, maybe, or several conferences. Uh, it's, uh, at the same time, an opportunity and a challenge for Russia. I mean, it's for everybody, including the, including Japan. So um, uh, if, we, if it is likely to see a Russia-China split, um, it is not uh, very likely, I should say. Uh, the major question is if the current level uh, of uh, Russia-China, well, political and special security cooperation persists, if the Russia and China move to get more together, uh, to perhaps even towards to a quasi-alliance or an alliance, or will it be as it is, or, or will uh, the two sides uh, grow more uh, independent of each other and uh, n not closer, but rather further? Uh, I think this is the major question. And from Russia's perspective, we do really need stable and good relations with China. And there are a lot of reasons, like uh, polycentric world order, uh, that we uh, enjoy support uh, from each other, at least partly with, uh, with the West, uh, that we cannot be truly encircled if we do not support uh, the, uh, the other powers which work against each other. And many other things that make uh, China really um, um, uh, a very important partner for us and the border, the longest border of Russia, and so many, so uh, few people living in the Far East, 6 million, and more than 300 million people living in the neighboring provinces of China. All, all this is a huge factor. But however, uh, I, I don't really think that unless uh, Russia-US confrontation moves to something much, much bigger that Russia would like to, to make an alliance with China, because Russia is uh, anyway not interested in supporting China's hegemony in East Asia, and moving into alliance would make Russia into an equal subordinate position, which is not also in Russia's interest. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what do you uh, you want to ask for uh, for me uh, with your question. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I'm not good at uh, predict what uh, the Chinese government would uh, uh, behave on this matter. But uh, one thing could be say is that uh, uh, so far the Chinese people would take uh, the the problem, the North Korea problem, as a, a very uh, lifeline for China because they think the territory is. The line is the North Korea, but uh, in these years, recent years, uh, many Chinese people thinking are, have changed. Especially, uh, some book have reviewed, have told uh, told the people that uh, the the history, uh, the North Cor uh, the Korean War was not started by the South Korea, but uh, rather by North Korea. So this kind of fact have uh, uh, issued people uh, have triggered people to think about to think it over and over again, something like that. 
Um, very briefly, in response to your, your second question, I think really uh, Dr. Yamazoe's uh, kind of response covered that, that quite clearly part of Japan's policy is to, um, to address the concerns about China and Russia's ever closer uh, relations and to try and neutralize that, um, that concern. Okay, we're, re we're really quite short of time now, so I might take these three together, if that's okay. Okay, I'll be very quick. Daniel Hurst, I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, my question is for Dr. Uh, Kudieva. Um, just big picture on Japan-Russia relations. Um, we know what uh, Prime Minister Abe wants um, in terms of joint economic development and so on in the territories, but big picture, what can President Putin offer Abe in the year ahead? in terms of the relationship and in terms of what what um, wins uh, Putin can offer towards Abe when he visits. And secondly, to um, Dr. Yamazoi, how do you interpret the comment from the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia about Aegis Ashore, about having to take that into the military planning? Thank you. Siegfried uh, Gittel, journalist from Germany. <clears throat> what about it, uh, uh, why is it the distrust between China and uh, Russia? Is there still some uh, unresolved uh, territorial isu issues or what, what, why is the distrust uh, uh, between both countries? Kurt Sieber, Austrian Business Council. Mine is uh, very short. It's more a verification than a question. In uh, Professor Kireva's uh, presentation, the um, trade between uh, Russia and uh, North Korea was indicated as 76.8 billion. Billion. Uh, oh, million. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, you you answered the question. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, there are no uh, territory problems nowadays between. Uh, Russia and China, but uh, since uh, the split uh, between the Soviet Union and, uh, and China, of course China want to make would uh, like to make a lot of uh, stories to uh, against the Soviet Union. So this kind of stories, uh, a lot of, a lot of stories, and this has looted a very bad image. And this maybe can say one of the results of the distrust. Very shortly, what can Putin offer Abe uh, when um, Abe visits Moscow, right? And um, this is only, I, I would also like to know what, what, what can Putin offer, but um, I, if I may speculate a bit, um, actually, um, this could be joint economic activities uh, if we have any consensus on the legal framework, which is a tricky thing, as James mentioned. I do agree with that because Russia is highly unlikely to agree on anything, not on uh, under. Russian jurisdiction. Um, perhaps uh, the next thing could be a more robust security uh, and political cooperation. We have already resumed two plus two dialogue, foreign ministers and defense ministers. We could upgrade our exercises um, and um, then there could be a dialogue uh, on the m uh, ministerial level between the ministers of defense uh, and uh, further political dialogue perhaps. Um, so and also uh, as uh, James already mentioned next uh, this this year is when uh, it's Russia's year in, in Japan and Japan's year in Russia and uh, a huge task that Russia needs to do is improve Russia's image in Japan which is very rather negative I should say so uh, this could be public diplomacy which should really work and and this is the thing that we are supposed to do this year at least uh, as for territorial issues I, I think that joint economic activity is high on that agenda now I think it is the the highest thing that our um, ministers are working now. And if I may add on sources of distrust, just by naming them, because we don't have time. Um, so, of course, we have territorial issue resolved officially. Um, uh, th there are different sources of distrust, like what are strategic intentions of China in East Asia, sp especially, and how uh, does China see how Russia could fit into East Asia? Uh, I think um, this also needs uh, more discussion. Of course, connecting the Belt and Road Initiative or One Belt, One Road and Eurasian Economic Union. What could be the forms of practical connection of these projects? And uh, if China 
if Chinese actions uh, would really like, and if China really would like to, to, to take Russia on board with some multilateral projects rather than act bilaterally with Central Asia, for example, what it is really now doing. So is it uh, going to, 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 to take Russia into this? And how are we going to work on our unbalanced trade structure? Uh, about 70 something percent is Russia's oil and gas uh, and manufactured goods. So how are we going to turn economic partnership uh, into uh, something more equal? Uh, and, and this is a huge question for Russia as well. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so two final things in closing. If you didn't uh, receive uh, an email directly from us about this event and you'd like to receive information about future events, please leave your business card in the basket at the front door. We also have, um, I can see, three upcoming events and uh, we'd be delighted to see you again here at ICAST. So thank you very much to our three guest speakers and thank you very much for, for coming to listen. Thank you.